Hello and uh, welcome one and all. Today we will cover Python's Pandas library. It is the go-to library for data analysis and data science. The effective data analysis requires the ability to extract, clean, reshape, index, slice, and summarize data. If you are familiar with data warehousing term ETL, extract, transform, and load, we can perform all of these actions with Pandas. I will cover all of these topics with example in this session. If you have never used Pandas and want to get comfortable using it, or if you are familiar with it and trying to figure out how to perform a certain action, then stay tuned. Also, I'll pin a timeline of this video so you can jump to a particular topic at any time. During this session, I'll be using Jupyter Notebook to import data and perform these steps. Jupyter Notebook provides a web-based interactive environment, allowing the combination of code, text, and other media into a web-based document. We can execute each cell of the notebook individually and see the output under the cell. In my opinion, it is very easy to write and test code in more of a discovery environment as compared to writing a whole program and then testing it. If you save a result into a variable, we can reference it anywhere in the notebook. This allows us to build on top of our code. If you are new to Python and need to set up an environment, then be sure to check out my video on setting up Python's data science environment on Windows. I'll leave the link to the video in the description below. Also data and the complete notebook are available on my GitHub repo. Link is in the description below. We will focus on Pandas data frame object. Data frame is a structure that contains two dimensional data. In other words, data is stored in rows and columns. Data frames are widely used in data analysis, data science, machine learning, and many other data intensive fields. Data frames are similar to SQL tables or spreadsheets that we work with in Excel. In many cases, data frames are faster easier to use, and more powerful than tables or spreadsheets because they are an integral part of the Python ecosystem. Pandas handles large data sets very well as compared to Excel. Plus the option that Python offers is another reason to use Pandas. We can create data frames manually, but in most cases we will import data from a file or a database. I have a Jupyter Notebook open First, let's go over the user interface. We have the toolbar above. This gives us the option to save, add, cut, move, or run a cell from here. We can also stop and restart the notebook from the toolbar. Once we select a cell, we have the option to mark it as a code or markdown. Markdown is a markup language and it allows us to format the text using a plain text editor. In the markdown cell, we can save comments or mark it as a heading. Once we select a cell, it changes color. Now we can run the selected cell from the toolbar or we can run it using the keyboard shortcut Shift plus Enter. As with anything in Python code, we need to import the required libraries. You can install a library directly in the notebook. We can insert a new cell from the toolbar or we can use the keyboard shortcut. Once we have a cell selected, you can press the escape key and hit A to add the cell above or B key to add the cell below. To delete a cell, we can use the cut icon from the toolbar or press escape key and hit D key to delete a cell. Pandas library comes pre-installed with Python. But let me demonstrate how we can install a library in the notebook. We can issue a pip install command preceded with an exclamation mark. I'll go ahead and run this cell and it tells me that uh, a requirement is already satisfied, meaning pandas is already installed. So I'll go ahead and get rid of this line. To delete a cell, we can use the cut icon from the toolbar or press escape key and hit D key to delete a cell. As usual, we will import the required libraries at the top. I'll go ahead and import pandas library and the common naming convention is to alias pandas as pd. So we will follow it. Once the cell is executed, notebook will assign it a number. 
if a cell is executing, it will have an asterisk sign next to it. Before starting, I'll go ahead and set a display option for pandas. I am formatting the float type numbers with a thousand separator and setting the decimal places to zero. Now we can reference pandas as PD in our code. I will go ahead and import data from an Excel file. We can read data with pandas library read underscore Excel function. We will spy the file path to this function. And if your file is stored in the same folder as your Jupyter notebook, then we simply pass in the file name. Otherwise you can supply the complete file path to this function. If you're working with CSV file, then you can simply replace Excel to CSV in the pandas read underscore Excel function. And you can import data from a CSV file. Once a cell is selected, we can run the cell by clicking on the run button on the menu bar above, or we can run it with a keyboard shortcut shift plus enter. I'll be using the keyboard shortcut option. If you need an example on how to import data from a database, I have covered this in one of my other videos. I'll leave the link in the description below. The first thing we should do when we read in our data is to inspect it. We want to make sure that our data frame isn't empty. We can check the data frame by calling the df.empty attribute. This returns false, meaning we have successfully loaded the data. We want to verify that the file was read in properly. This initial check will also give us an idea where should we direct our data cleansing efforts. Data is stored in the df variable. It is of type data frame. Let's see how our data looks like. For this, we can use the head and the tail methods. We will call df.head. This will by default print the first five rows. By default, data frame will add a row number to our data. This is to identify each row. This is called the index. It is similar to row number in Excel or auto incrementing primary key in a SQL table. We can change the number of returned rows by the head method by passing in a number in the parentheses. We can pass in 10 to get the 10 rows. This will be handy if you want to show top 10 products or employees on your report. To get the last five rows, we will use the tail method. And similarly, we can change the number of rows by passing in the number in the parentheses. So far, so good. We have the data. Next, we check how much data we read in. We want to know the number of observations or rows and the number of variables or columns we have in our data set. We use the shape attribute for this. Our data set contains 60,880 observations and 20 variables. We can check the column header names with df.columns. This will print out all the columns in our data frame. If we decide, we can rename the column headers to shorten the names or fix any spelling mistakes. For this, we can use the rename function to rename the column headers. I'll call the df.rename function and pass in the columns argument or in the curly bracket, pass the old column header colon new column header name. For instance, I'll rename product category to category and sales territory to territory and the rest of the columns. Once I execute the cell, our column headers are changed. Examining the whole data frame, we can focus on one or multiple columns. If we want to examine one column, then we call the df and in the square brackets supply the column name. This will give us a single column, in this case the product column. This prints out all the rows for this column. As you may have noticed that the row index starts from zero. So the rows are from zero to 60,879. However, our data frame contains 60,880 rows. We can limit the number of rows for this column. We will pass in the row index zero colon five in the square brackets after the column name. Let's go ahead and print this cell. This will print out the first five rows. The row index starts from zero, so it will go up to the fourth index. So these are the first five rows for this column. We can also pass in multiple column names as a list if you want to look at uh, two or more columns. 
So in this case, we are looking at category and product. We can also reference a column with a df dot column name, but this doesn't work if your column name has spaces. So I would stick to using the square brackets with referencing columns. We can narrow down our data frame by passing in list of columns and saving it to a variable. I will pass in the following columns as a list and execute the cell. This will give us a data frame object that is a subset of our original data frame. We have trimmed a large data set to a few columns that we want to focus on. Let's see how we can check and update data type of columns in our data frame. To check data types, we can use the dtypes attribute from pandas. Most of the columns are object type. These are text or mixed numeric and non-numeric values. Similar to a var car or variable characters in a database table. We want to make sure that our date column is of date time type. So we can access the pandas date time function. On date time, we can perform date operations. For example, uh, we can extract year or month from the column. Let's assume our date column is of object or string type, and we want to convert it to date time. For this, pandas provides us with two underscore date time function, and to this function, we can pass in a data frame column. In this case, it will be the date column. We save the result of this in the data frame date column. Once we run the cell, it will convert this column to a date time. Now we should be able to access the date time function for this column. We can convert to other data types as well. Let's convert list price column to integer. We call the as type function on this column and supply the data type of int for integer. This column currently is of float type and we are converting it to an integer. End result will be that we get a whole number and we drop the decimal places from this column. I will go ahead and execute the cell. This conversion throws an error. Let's scroll down and see the error message. The error says that we cannot convert non-finite values to integer. This suggests that we have NAN or missing values in the data frame for this column. This is a nice segue into our next topic, how to check and fix null values. We can utilize the isNull function and call the any function on top of it. This returns true for a few of the columns. This means that these columns contain null values and it includes the list price column. Let's say if you want to check the total null values for a column, then we can use the sum function on top of is null. This will give us the total number of null values. Let's go ahead and run this cell. This tells us that we have 39 null values in the list price column. So the next question is, how do we handle null values in a column? Pandas also make this a breeze. It provides a built-in function called filna to handle nulls. We will get a hold of the column and call the filna function on it. We provide the default value of unknown since this column contains string values. This will fill in the missing values with unknown. Also, we set the in-place parameter to true. This is important because this tells pandas to update the original data frame object. If you were to leave this clause out, then this would print the unknown value for the missing values on the screen, but the data frame object would not be updated. Therefore, this column would still contains missing values. Let's go ahead and execute this cell. We have filled missing values with unknown value for this column. We will look at an example where we will leave out the in-place parameter. I'll go ahead and run this cell this doesn't show all the rows, so therefore we don't see any unknown values here. Let's go ahead and print out the total missing values. We see that category column no longer contains missing values. However, the subcategory still has 39 NAN or missing values. So it is important to set the in place clause if you want to update the underlying data frame object. I'll go ahead and include this clause and run the updated cell. This time around, we shouldn't see any missing values for the subcategory column. For integer type column, we can call the fill now function with zero. For float, we add 0.00. I'll go ahead and uh, keep this as zero. 
And once we execute this, it will fill in the missing values with a zero. So the list price missing values should be set to zero now. So there shouldn't be any missing values for the list price column. If I check, it tells us that there are zero missing values. We can scroll back up and execute the cell where we were trying to convert the list price column to integer from float. I'll run this cell and this time around it executes without any issues. This is how we handle missing values in our data frame and how we can convert columns from one data type to another. Let's get some stats from the columns. I'll go ahead and print the distinct values in the category column. I am referencing a column with a dot notation, so I'm saying df.category. This is another way of accessing data frame column. Make sure your column does not contain any spaces. We can print the column just like before. However, I would stick to the first approach where we provide the column name in square bracket just in case your column name has spaces in it. This approach is better and works for different scenarios. Anyways, let's get back and uh, use pandas unique function on this column to get the distinct values in this column. There are four distinct values and the unknown values which we set for the missing values. In the similar fashion, we can call the aggregate function on a numeric column. Let's say we want to see the total sales amount in this data set. We can use the aggregate function sum to get the total from this column. To get the count, we can use the count function from the pandas. So we can call the count function on the quantity column. This gives us the count of quantity. It is the same figure as the number of rows or observations we have in this data frame. Let's see how we slice a data frame. We'll be covering filtering data frame on single or multiple conditions. When we want to extract certain rows or slices from our data frame, we use slicing. I am passing in three columns as a list to the data frame. And once again, we, we only want to get rows with index values of 10 to 13. The first index is inclusive. That means it'll be included in the result set. And the last index being exclusive. The last index will not be part of the result. This gives us rows from 10 to 12 and only returns the three columns specified as the list. When we combine our rows and column selection, this is known as chaining. We are passing multiple columns in the square bracket and this is followed by an index in square brackets. Let's use chaining method to update the values in the category column to lowercase. The first letter of each value begins with an uppercase and we want to convert it to lowercase. You may need to do this if you're performing some sort of a text comparison. In theory, we can grab the rows with index and select the column. Then we select the same rows and column and call the string.lower function on it. Let me add a new cell above and call the string.lower function on the selected rows and column. This shows that the value of category column are converted to lowercase. We are saving the result of this in the same row and column in the data frame. Once I execute this, it throws a warning that a value is trying to be set on the copy of slice from a data frame. And it suggests that try using dot lock instead. Lock stands for location in the data frame, and we can identify location with row and column index. Along with lock, we will also cover iLock or integer location as well. First, let's print the data frame so we have few rows to work with. Let's say we want to print out the first value in the category column, which is clothing. We can use df.lock and in the square bracket pass in the row index. The row index for the first row is zero and the column is category. This is what above warning is telling us to do. I'll go ahead and run the cell. This gives us the first value, which is clothing. It is similar to selecting a single cell value in Excel. And using this technique, we can select any cell value. Since we want to perform an operation on multiple rows, we need to get the index and the value of multiple rows. Iter rows function that is available, and we can use that in a for loop to get the index and the row content. In this case, we're only iterating over three indices here, but we can remove the indices and iterate over the whole data frame. 
this gives us the index and the row and we can perform any desired operation on these rows. I'll go ahead and reset the indices and let's print out the index and the row values. I'll go ahead and run this cell. It prints out the index value and then prints out the entire row. The index value is 10 and then followed by the entire row content. Then it repeats for the next two rows. Let's just focus on the category column since we are only interested in it. We can pass in the column name in the square bracket after the row. This gives us the index and the category column value. We can see that the first letter is no longer capital. Even though the pandas issued a warning when we performed the operation above, but it updated the rows. Let's revert the rows to their original state. First letter as capital. For this, we can use the title function from pandas. It will set the text in title casing. All major or first words are capitalized. I'll execute the cell with this function. And at first we don't see any changes, but I'll comment the function out and run the cell again. It shows that the rows are updated. The title casing is back for these rows. Now we can convert these to lowercase with this approach. This action performed without any issues. I'll run the cell again and we can see that the text is converted to lowercase. So if you come across this warning during any operations, you can iterate over the data frame and use the lock along with the row and column index to solve it. I'll go ahead and revert these rows to the title casing with the title function. We can test the above rows to make sure they are in their original state. Since we know the row index, we can use it with the lock along with the column to set values. But in most cases, we'll have to iterate over the rows and check for condition. To extend this approach, we'll see how to create a new column using the lock along with if else logic. We are iterating over the entire data frame and then we are checking the condition if row value of sales territory column equals the following value. We can check multiple conditions with in clause and each condition is in quotes and separated by comma. This is similar to SQL's in operator. So we can check for these condition in the territory and if they do exist, then we call the df.lock and pass in the index that is returned by the iter rows function and we provide a new column name we are calling it region for above condition we will set the values to americas and in the else if or elif clause we check if territory row value is in germany france and united kingdom then we set the region value to europe and in the else clause we set the values to australia I'll go ahead and execute this cell and this returns an error. Let's check what this error is about. This tells me that sales territory column does not exist. And it is true as I have renamed it to territory. So I'll go ahead and update the column name for all the rows to territory and I'll try this again. It seems that I did not include the territory column in the revised data frame. So I will re-import the data again. And once this completes, I'll run the cell where I'm calling the rename function to update the column name. And uh, next, I'll add the territory column to the cell where I am revising the data frame uh, with few columns. So I'll supply, I'll add this to the list. I'll print the data frame and now it includes the territory column. So we can head down and carry on with building a new column based on this territory. So I'll execute the cell to check for a condition and create a new column called region. This is based on the territory column. This calculation is computational heavy and it will take some time to complete since we are iterating over 60,000 rows and checking each row for a condition. I will let this run and remember asterisk means that the cell is still executing. We can build the same column with lock syntax. So we can call the df.lock and in the lock we provide the df.territory. I'll need to update the column name here for all the rows. We are checking for condition with is in clause. 
and in the parentheses we pass in the condition in a list format. Remember, list is in a square bracket and each value is separated by a comma. So if territory value is in these values, then we provide a column name. I am going to go ahead and call this region two and set the value for this column. And in the similar fashion, we are checking the next set of conditions in the row two for Europe. And in row three, we are checking the condition for Australia and setting the values respectively. I will wait for the above cell to complete. And once it does, then we can execute the cell with the second method. You will see how quicker the second option is. Okay, finally, the execution of the logic is complete and we should see a new column in our data frame. I'll go ahead and insert the cell above and call the df.head. We have the region column in our data frame now. Okay, let's go ahead and execute the cell below with the similar logic to create region two column. I'll run the cell and within an instance, it completes. I'll call the df.head again to see the new column. Both columns have the same value, but the second method took a second and required less computational resources. In order to check if our logic is correct for region and region two column, we can call the group by function and supply it. And it should be territory column, not sales territory. So I'll go ahead and update that. Group by is similar to SQL group by function as it groups rows that have the same value into a summary row. So we get a summarized view of the data. On the group by function, we call the size attribute. The size attribute returns the number of elements in the underlying data. I'll execute the cell. And the main reason we are summarizing is to check the territory to region mapping. For example, for Australia, our region mapping is correct. For Canada, it should be Americas and it is correct. And we can go ahead and verify the rest of the rows. This summary helps us quickly verify our logic. The size returns the number of records or transactions we have for each territory and region. This also gives us a flavor of analytics transactions per territory. Okay, this was a quick introduction to lock. The lock property is used to access a group of rows and columns. Next, we take a look at ILOC. This stands for integer location. I'll print out the first four rows of data frame with the df.ilock and pass in the row index one to four. You may have noticed that the end index is exclusive as it is not included in the result. This gives us the first four rows as the index starts from zero. Let's say we want to get a hold of the first row. We can call the ilock and in the square brackets, pass in the row index of zero. This will give us the first row as a series. So we have each column along with its corresponding value. Let's say if you want to get the all column as a data frame, we can enter a colon and one after the row index. This will print the entire first row of the data frame. And we can build on top. If you want to get multiple rows, then we supply the row index. I will increment the second index to two, and this will give us the first two rows. However, the main reason we use iLock is to get a specific location in the data frame. Let's say if we want to get the very first value or the first cell value in the data frame, we can get this value by passing in the row and the column index. The first value is for row index and we separate the second value of column index with a comma. So zero comma zero. This will print the value of clothing. If we wanted to print the second value of the first column, which is accessories, it will be one comma zero. This will print out the value of accessories. This is the second, but the row index starts from zero. So one gives us the second value. We can move to the second column. So the index location will be one comma one. In this case, we want to get the second row value of the second column. This will give us the value of locks. So this is how we can get a particular location value. If you want to get a single cell value, 
Then we can use the add property. Let's get the value of logs with add. We pass in the row index of one and provide the column name. This gives us the same value of logs. But if we need multiple values with row and column index, then iLog is the way to go. Let's demonstrate how we can get multiple rows and columns. Let's see with the log first. We are getting the row 10 to 15, and we are only focusing on the columns category and sales. This gives us sales and category and rows 10 to 15. We can obtain the same rows with the iLog property. Since it's integer location, we'll have to pass in the column index value along with the row index. I'll give the same row index, but we are passing the column index this time. I know the category is the first column, so it has the index of zero, and I think the sale index is six. Let's run the cell and check it out. It gives us row 10 to 14. That means the end index is exclusive. It is not included in the result set. So we need to go one index up. This gives us the same rows. Index six is for quantity, so I'll have to update it to index seven. This gives us the same result as above. Next, we'll cover how to get column index. Let's say if you have a large data frame and you want to get columns by their index. For this, the getLog function comes in handy. On the df.columns attribute, we can call the get underscore log function and it takes the column name as an argument. So we'll provide sales and this gives us the location of the column. For sales, the index is seven. There are times we want to know the indices for all columns. For that, we can use a for loop. So for call or columns in the df.columns, then we print the column and call the get underscore log function and pass it the call variable. This will give us, this will print the column names and then it will print the index. We can format this so it prints the name and the index in one row. We can use the format function for this. The format function formats the string and we can insert values with placeholders. The placeholder is defined by curly braces. So we provide the call variable that we got from iter rows and we call the get underscore lock function and supply the call variable. This gives us the column name and index in a single row. So column name is category and index is zero. We are looking at sales and its index is seven. So this is how we can print the column name and index in a single row using the format function. Moving on, we will see how we can add and delete columns in a data frame. First, we'll add a column. Here I am converting the date column with the date time function, just to make sure that we can access the date time functions. Then we are declaring a new column, calling it year. DF date column, and on the date column we call dt.year. Once we print the data frame, we see a new year column added to it. The dt.year extract the year from the date column, and then we save it to a new column. Let's say we want to drop a column from the data frame. For example, we no longer need this column for analysis. And for this, we can call the df.drop function. Uh, this takes the column name, so we'll provide list price, and we'll set the access to one and in place to true. Once we execute the cell, it will drop the list price column from the data frame. If you want to drop multiple columns, then we can pass in the list of column names in square bracket. I'll go ahead and also drop the region two column from the data frame since we already have a region column. Let's move on to summarizing data. Currently we have around 60,000 rows and we want to look at the summary. We want to see the sales total by category. For this, we can use the group by function. I'll save the result in category underscore sales variable we call the group by function and provided the column we are grouping this data by and we will sum the sales column. 
let's also sort the values in descending order I'll go ahead and execute the cell and this gives us sales total by category let's say we wanted to get a top 10 product report I'll copy this code and add this to the next cell I'll change the column to product we can call the head method on the category underscore sales variable and pass in the value of 10. This will give us sales by product in descending order and then we are limiting the number of rows to 10. So here it is, the top 10 products by sales. Let's say next we want to see the row or transaction count by category. For this, we can call the df dot category and call the value underscore count function. This will give us the number of transactions by each category. For the next exercise, I'll print out the data frame. Let's say we want to pivot this data by year. Pandas makes this a breeze. It has a pivot table function and in the pivot table, we set the index to category. Category will be in the rows and columns to year. Each year will be a separate column and we want to sum the sales values. We have the categories in the rows, year in the column, and intersection is the aggregated sales amount. This is how we can create pivot tables in Pandas. All we need is one line of code and place your index, column, and values variable, and you have yourself a pivot table. Last, we'll go over how to save the revised data frame as the Excel file. Let's say we have performed our analysis, clean and shape the data. Now it's time to save it into a file and send it to a user or a colleague. Pandas provides us with two Excel function. There's also a two CSV function. We provide the file name and set the index to false, since we don't want to see the auto-generated row number in the file. Once we run the cell, the data frame is saved as an Excel file. I'll go ahead and open the Excel file we just generated. It looks all right as is. We can format the data frame output for Excel in order to make it more presentable in case you are sending it to end users or external parties. So in the next session, we'll look at how to curate and format the data frame for an Excel report. I hope you find this session useful. If you like the content, be sure to like and subscribe. Post any questions that you may have. Take care of yourself and I'll see you in the next video.